Hey buckaroos and buckarettes, it's good to be back with you and today I want to show you how to calculate the area moment inertia of a C beam. You know, that's a beam that's got a cross section shaped like a C and it's different than uh, an I beam that has a cross section shaped like an I, although maybe not as different as you think. First thing to wonder is why would you want to calculate area moment of inertia? It seems like kind of an arcane thing to do. I know probably some propeller head professor like me asked you to do it on a homework. But why did that person ask you to do it? Well, there's a reason. Let's take a regular beam. This is a piece of aluminum that I've, that I've messed around with. Imagine it's clamped on this end. Imagine it, it's a, it can't deform on this and there's no rotation and there's no deflection here. And we put a load out here. So it's kind of like somebody standing on a diving board. Okay? What does the deflection out here look like? What's the expression for it? Well, it's, if I have a beam, let's, let's draw it out here. And this is that shorthand we use for, for problems like this. That indicates that we've, the, this end is clamped. This, this sort of hash marks over here says what's ever over there is rigid, uh, infinitely rigid and infinitely massive. So it, there's no deflection there. There's no uh, vertical deflection and there's no rotation there. I've got a beam out here and I'll put a force out there. Well, that could be anything. That could be a kid standing on the end of a diving board. Who knows what that is. But if, if you look at the center line of the beam, the elastic axis, it'll move down like that, and that distance right there we'll call delta x. Okay, delta x, delta y, delta h, whatever you want to call it. Well, that expression is, let's see, make sure I get this right here, nfl cubed over 3ei. Well, there's i right there. That's your area moment of inertia. Well, let's think about this as a stiffness. Remember how in, when you're looking at a spring, F equals K delta X, where that's, I'll get my head out of your way here in a second, that's stiffness. Okay, stiffness of a spring. Well, this looks enough like this that we can actually work with it. So let's, there's F and there's delta X. Let's just rearrange this a little bit. So there, here's this rearranged to put F on one side of the equal sign and delta X on the other. That means the stuff inside those brackets, that's the stiffness of a beam. And the stiffness comes from basically two places. It comes from the geometry and it comes from the material the beam is made out of. Well, E is the elastic modulus. That's stiffness due to the material. I and L have to do with the geometry of the beam. This has to do with the length of the beam and that has to do with its cross section. So those are the parts of stiffness that come from the way you shape the beam. So there's why you want I. It's the part of stiffness that ha that's determined by the cross-sectional shape of the beam. All right, now that's pretty important. Now we have a good reason to calculate it. Let's try it. So I'm going to erase all this stuff. And let's do a cross-section. Well, I made these little, these little boards here with magnets on the back of it. So let's make ourselves a C cross section, okay? Let me slide it over here a little bit. I made these last night. There. There's a C-shaped beam for obvious reasons, that's what we call it. Well, when you calculate area moment of inertia, what we do typically is we divide a more complicated shape up into a bunch of simple ones. So I've got three rectangles here, and the way I set this up, they're all the same size, but they don't need to be. So there's one, there's two, and there's three. Let's maybe number them, okay? So that's one, and that's two, and that's three. Oops, moved. Three, oops, there we go. It's a little sloppy, but there it is. One, two, and three. Okay, we need, we're gonna need some dimensions to make this work. Well, let's make this, let's assume this is 100 millimeters. And let's say the height here is 30 millimeters. Okay. And they're all three the same size, so there you go. Now, the next thing you've got to figure out is the axis about which you want to calculate the area mo moment of inertia. Basically, is the beam being pushed this direction or that direction? Well, let's assume for, the, for our purposes that the beam is loaded from the top. 
you know, maybe this is part of a, a, a structure of a building or maybe a truss or something like that. So it's being loaded from the top. I want the area moment of inertia about the x-axis, and I'm going to place the x-axis right at the centroid. Okay, so I want the area moment of inertia due to a vertical load, so it's about this axis right there. And because this beam is symmetric top to bottom, the centroid is going to be right there. All right? So, you know, if that's 100 millimeters and this is 100 millimeters, that's 50. That's 50. So I move my beam. Okay? So, we know how to do this. There's actually two ways to calculate this. One uses what we call positive area, and one makes use of a concept called negative area. Let's do the positive area one first. Now I'm going to slide this over to get it out of the way so we have some room here on my little board. Okay, there's that. Let me clean out some space here. All right, now, the, the expression for area moment of inertia, we're going to use something called the parallel axis theorem. So the total area moment of inertia of the beam is the area moment inertia of part one plus a one d one squared. And I'll tell you what all these are here in a, are in a second, but let me let me just write it out. Okay. Now there's one term for each element in the beam. So here's there's one term that goes right there. This one is that one, and this one is that one. Okay, that's how we're going to do this. Now, this isn't very helpful. Let me put it back together over here. So, there's that. There's that. This is like Legos, man. I love this. Okay. Now, can you guys see that? Okay, okay, you can see that. So, what I need to know is the area moment of inertia. Now, by the way, number one and number three have the same one. So if I wanted to, I could do it this way. Okay, that gives me the exact same answer, and I'll probably do it that way. So I1 is 1 12 bh cubed, because that's the expression for area moment of inertia of a rectangle. So it's 1 over 12 times 100 millimeters, because that's this width right here is 100 millimeters times 30 millimeters cubed. Okay, and I'm doing this in millimeters. If you want to do this in inches, you can too. The units don't really matter. Because remember, physics doesn't care about our units. Physics just works. Units are something we put in there to uh, make it mathematically a little more tractable. So when you work that out, let me cheat here, you get 2.25 times 10 to the fifth millimeters to the fourth. Now millimeters to the fourth is a really weird unit. Area to the fourth is, is not intuitive. There's nothing, you know, I can't tell you, you know, what does that really mean? Well, that's, that's the units that come out of this calculation. That's what's built into that expression. So it's area to the fourth. Okay, I2 is different than I1, even though these are the exact same shape, exact same size. They're placed differently. They're oriented differently. And because of that, they've got a different stiffness in the vertical direction. So let's 112 bh cubed again, only now b and h have switched. So b is now 30 millimeters, and h is 100. And because I'm cubing a much larger number, the answer I get is a lot bigger. Well, that makes sense. A beam that you lay down it's going to be a lot less stiff than one that's vertical. Look at the floor joists in a house. Nobody ever makes floor jo joists this way. The floor would feel like a trampoline. You make them this way so the floor is nice and stiff. I got another video on that too, so go check it out. So there's my, put my beam back together. And if you work this out, this comes out to uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the fourth. Okay, so I've got that term and that term taken care of. What's A? Well, A is just area. So A is just BH, so that's 30 millimeters times 100 millimeters. Don't even need your calculator for this one. That's 3,000 millimeters squared. 
Now what's D? D is the distance between the centroid of the entire shape and the centroid of the individual elements. Well, the centroid of the entire shape, I only care about the vertical location because I'm, I'm interested in vertical. I don't care about its location left or right. That doesn't appear in here anywhere. D is a vertical distance because this is being loaded vertically. If I was loading it from the side, number one, I'd have to figure, find the area moment of inertia around a vertical axis, and that would be measured horizontally rather than vertically. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So there's really only one dimension I need, and that's this. That's 65 millimeters because that's 50 millimeters, and this distance right here is half of 30. So it's 50 plus th uh, 15. And it's the same down here. Okay. Now this one, D is zero because the center of gra gravity or the, the, the uh, centroid of box two is the same as the centroid for the entire shape. So that number right there is zero. Okay. So I know my areas now. I know that zero and I know that. If you add all those together, what you're going to get is, let me get this right, 2.8 Three. Oops, try that again. 2.83 times 10 to the 7 millimeters to the fourth. That is a really unsatisfying number, you know it? That's really big. Why is that number 28.3 million? Well, it's because I'm dealing with a shape that's about that big, that's about 100 millimeters by about 100 and, what is that, 160 millimeters that way. But a millimeter is about that big. There's a whole bunch of these in one of those. And when I take that, the, start raising those, that, that difference to the fourth power, this number gets really big really fast. There's not much to be said good for the English system of units, but if there is one thing, it's that you get human-sized numbers. An inch is about that big, and so you tend not to get these really large or really small magnitude numbers. If I did this in meters, now I would be dividing by a thousand to the fourth power. This gets a lot smaller really quick. Um, so that's one way to do it. And this is using what we call positive area. I'm looking at the area there, the area there, and the area there there's another way to do this. Let me erase this stuff and I'm going to make one change. Okay, let's take this area right there. Okay, maybe I'll call that A2. Okay. I could calculate the area moment of inertia of this entire, this entire rectangle and subtract that out if I want to. What that would look like, this is now negative area, okay, this is this large rectangle, okay, minus 1 12th bh cubed um, this is the empty space. That's this right here. I can do this mathematically. It's identical to the calculation I just made. Look, don't don't believe me because I tell you. Believe me because I prove it to you. Let's try this. Okay, that's going to be a hundred is the base times. Now the height is now hundred and sixty. It's 100 here, plus 30, plus 30, and that's cubed. Now, let's subtract out this. Well, that's 100, and that's 100 minus 30, so that's 70 wide. So 1 12th times 100 millimeters the base times, I'm sorry, not uh, 170 is the middle is the base. Times 100 is the height. Well, if you work that out, let me just double check here. Okay, 
you also get 2.83 times 10 to the seventh millimeters to the fourth. I get the exact same answer. Therefore, it has to be, as a, well, not therefore, but it's a pretty good indication these are mathematically equivalent. One more thing. At the beginning, I mentioned an I-beam, right? Well, this isn't an I-beam. This is a C-beam. If I were designing a structure, I'd really care about the difference between an I-beam and a C-beam most of the time. But if I know this thing is being loaded vertically, whether it's an I-beam or a C-beam doesn't affect the area moment of inertia. And here's why. Let me erase my little marks here. And I'm going to be the beam whisperer here for a second. If I take this and I slide it over there like that, I just turn my C-beam into an I-beam. Here's the thing, though. Did D, those D terms, did those change at all? No, that one's still 0, that one's still 65, and that one's still 65. Moving this, what's called the web, this vertical part here, moving it back and forth does not change the vertical stiffness of the beam. Now, it changes the horizontal stiffness. It changes some other things. It does not change the vertical stiffness. So when it, for strictly vertical loading, you're going to get the exact same answer for this as you do for this. Okay? It doesn't matter. You get the same answer either way. Well, there you go. I hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.